So we've done an A-stable multivibrator before. It's basically something that doesn't have any stable states at all and wiggles around all the time. If it has two well-defined states that it doesn't stay in but goes between, we call that an oscillator. And we've made that before. The one with two BJTs, two capacitors, and four resistors. And it also had both positive and negative outputs, or I should say regular and inverted outputs. Well, if we're using CMOS, once again, we can easily make one with far fewer components. Now, just to preface this, the circuit I'm about to show you is not the circuit you should be using. It's the base. It's the simplest, the absolute simplest you can make. And there's all kinds of components and different arrangements you can add to it to give it better behavior. For example, mine that I made on my breadboard, it's slightly uneven. The rising edge is longer than the falling edge. If you're using this to make pulses, that doesn't make much difference, but it's still not a perfect square wave. So there's all kinds of refinements you can make to this, and you can look around and find those little tweaks. But let me show you basically how this type of circuit works. And this is the simplest one yet. It uses only four components. There's no input, there's no trigger, because this runs on its own. It just goes back and forth, back and forth. If I take an inverter, a resistor, let me put the inverter up here. So an inverter, a resistor, a capacitor, and another inverter, you may be sensing a pattern with these. We're using another RC network. You'll see RC networks all over the place in all circuits for timing because they're so regular and stable. If you need something to run for a certain amount of time, stick a capacitor and resistor in there. There you go. Give myself some more space. So your output is this inverter, and I just call it Q because it goes high, low, high, low. It just alternates. It's roughly a square wave generator. The output of this inverter also connects to this side of the capacitor. The capacitor goes to the resistor and up and back into that inverter. So obviously there's feedback, otherwise how would it work? And this inverter is connected through this way. And like I said, this is the fundamentally most simple version. You'll find some with a resistor here also, different arrangements that all make it more or less stable or behave in different ways. But this is fundamentally the simplest form. And as for timing, instead of describing it as a certain amount of time, we describe a frequency. In this case, the frequency equals, and once again, it's approximate. I'll go ahead and use the approximately equal to symbol to say, you'll have to fiddle with it. This is just telling you roughly what you're going to get, but it's 2.2 times R times C, and that's the frequency. Because the circuit cycles roughly every 2.2 times R times C, and so the frequency of switching is the reciprocal of that. That's roughly what you're going to get. You'll have to test for yourself. But that gives you an idea, at least. So you have a starting point and tweak from there. So let me describe to you, there's no stable state, but let me describe to you one state. Let's say the output of Q is high. Let's just say it is. That means this inverter has to be putting out a high, which means it has to be receiving a low. This is short-circuited, so this has to be putting out a low, which means it has to be receiving a high. How did we get here? It basically cycles. I'm just introducing one spot in a circle, and then I'll show you the circle and how we get back to this. When the circuit starts up from no power, it quantum mechanical, thermal, etc., etc., it just wiggles its way into some point in the circle, and then the circle begins. You don't know exactly where, so you want to boot it up and wait a second before you're getting a clean clock pulse, but a lot of circuits are like that. You boot them up and they're all messy and then eventually they settle. So we've got a high output, high here, low here, low here, high here. Well, if we have a high here, that means we have a high here. If we have a high here, that means we have a high here. How is that possible? I should say here, not here. Let's say a high here. So how is that possible? Well, here's a resistor. We've got low on one side of the resistor, high on the other. That means there has to be current through the resistor because the resistor has to have a voltage drop to have high on one side and low on the other. So that means this capacitor is charging. How is it charging? Low output here. This is the output of the CMOS gate. So we've got low here through the resistor, through the capacitor, and high out of this CMOS gate. So the capacitor at this particular point in the circle is charging this way and current is going through the capacitor here. So that's how we can have high here and low there. So that's all hunky-dory, but this capacitor is eventually going to finish charging. So the voltage drop here is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually this spot, right, because the 
Voltage drop of the capacitor starts at zero, and the voltage drop of the resistor starts at everything, high to low. As the voltage drop of the resistor shrinks, the voltage drop of the capacitor grows. The capacitor acts as if it is a resistor. Remember, a charging capacitor acts as a variable resistor. A discharging capacitor acts as a battery, a battery that's running out of power quickly. So this effect of resistor is getting higher and higher and higher, which means its voltage drop is getting higher relative to this one. So this spot, because that's a voltage divider now, right? You got two resistors. This one's getting bigger, this one's staying the same. More voltage drop across this one. So this point is going down and down and down until eventually it's more low than high. It's low enough to turn off that inverter. So we start getting a low here because this resistor barely has any voltage drop compared to this one because the current has shrunk. So now we get a low over here. We get a high coming out of the inverter, which means it short circuits over here and puts a high into this inverter, which is low coming out and a low output because the output is short circuited to the CMOS gate output. So now we have switched very quickly to low and we no longer have this pattern here. So this side of the capacitor is getting its low, but what do we have? We have a charged capacitor. The capacitor is charged this way. It had high over here, low over here, but now through the resistor, it has high over here, low over here, it's backwards. So it begins to discharge. So it discharges through this as well because it's nowhere else it can have a complete circuit. It's pushing conventional current out this way into the low CMOS gate and it's being charged from this high CMOS gate through the resistor. And then the low connects into the power supply of the CMOS gate that is not drawn, but it's there. You've got your power pins here. So it's the high output through the resistor, through the capacitor, into this low output, and into the essentially grounding connector of this one, the negative power connector of this one, and then out the high. So there's your circuit. So this resistor has current going through it this way, which means it has a voltage drop this way. So we're able to sustain the high to low, and then the capacitor is discharging. Eventually the capacitor has fully discharged, so now it's empty, but it's still got the high low, so it's essentially still charging. It got rid of the charge it already had, and now it's building charge the other way. So it's still in the same direction, so we've still got current to this resistor, still got that nice voltage drop. But eventually, once again, this capacitor is going to charge up. It's going to charge up in this direction. So eventually this capacitor is going to get full, and it's not going to allow any more current through, which means it's going to choke off the current on this resistor, which means this voltage drop is going to get lower and lower and lower and lower, whereas this voltage drop is going to get higher and higher, there's our voltage divider again. So you can see if we've got high here, a small drop, a big drop, and low, this point is going to be very close to high. This high is going to get through more and more and more. Eventually, this is going to go high, which means we're going to get high onto our inverter, which is going to switch this to low, which is going to switch this to low, or it's the same thing, which is going to switch this to high. Short-circuited output goes high very quickly. Then our capacitor, which was fully charged, so it stopped conducting, almost fully charged. This will happen before it's completely charged, just enough to switch the gate. So now we've got high on the right and low on the left again, and it starts flowing back the other way, and now we're back where we started. So essentially, the capacitor charges that way, and you have a voltage divider of the actual resistor and the effective resistor doing a voltage divider, which when it's charging this way, the capacitor has a low drop, the resistor has a high drop, so this high is getting through to this inverter. Eventually it switches so that this is the low drop and this is the high drop, so this resistor gets close to this low, which puts a low through the inverter. Everything switches around and the capacitor goes the other way and the resistor goes the other way. And then you have the same thing. You have a high drop here and a low drop here. So that voltage is coming mostly across the resistor and this value is getting through. But as the capacitor's voltage drop gets bigger and this one gets smaller, this inverted from here, inverted from here, starts sneaking through the resistor and then switches it again. So this inverter, this action here, the voltage divider formed by the resistor and capacitor is giving a voltage to the inverter that's the opposite of the voltage the inverter is putting out. As long as there's a lot of current, every time the current gets small, the resistor is not essentially separating this end from this end of the inverter. See, because it's there's, this resistor is the only thing in between its both ends. So every time the resistor stops having much of an effect, the inverter inverts itself. And then the capacitor flips, right? Because this it, it inverts itself and then it inverts this one, which puts the opposite on the end of the capacitor. So 
So the capacitor all of a sudden is letting through current here. So now this puts up its wall again. And then the wall comes down, it inverts itself, which inverts this, which turns the capacitor back on, which turns this back on, which puts the wall back up. So you could look at it that way. So there you go. Another way to do a square wave generator. Unsurprisingly, there's 1,800 million of them. And we've gone through two. Oh, this'll take a while. So while I gain my second wind, I'll be seeing you.